Thank you for joining me for this third session about identity and confidence for young people with cochlear implants. Now, this is a recording. The live session was already a few days ago, but we don't record the live sessions because of the confidential nature of what some people like to share. So I'm going to try and paraphrase some of that for you today. Um, as a therapist, I've been working with a number of families through a range of hearing loss related issues and can really see that these identity and confidence workshops are slowly evolving. So let's crack on. So in session one, we talked about how shame is formed and how our earlier experiences form a sense of identity. We also covered some psychological principles to help you better understand your child, but also especially when they're having worries, for example, around when they're being bullied at school. The presentation also featured some helpful tips on how to foster more confidence around your child, who is different, but also emphasising at the same time that being different really is the only thing that we all have in common. We are surrounded by difference. In session two, we moved on by exploring some definitions of identity and of confidence. And we also covered the topic of learned behaviour. So what is happening is your child is modelling themselves on your behaviour. We also covered some communication theory to foster more effective communication between you and your child. So we looked at the ways in which we listen, the levels of listening, and we also ventured into feelings, thoughts, beliefs and facts. And it's important that we know the difference between those four, but also that a child learns the difference as well. Now, both of these sessions have been since recorded and can be found on YouTube. And this is obviously the recording for the third session. This is what you're listening to. So, this brings us to what I wanted to cover in part three. Can there ever be a deaf identity? Now, this is a very sensitive topic. Um, this topic has been a concern expressed by many parents and especially within some of the client families that I've been working uh, with. Now, what I usually do is halfway through these presentations is I'll stop sharing my screen during the live session and I will have a discussion, try to get some feedback. Now, as we go through the slides, I can't obviously share what was said in the live session because of confidentiality, but I'll paraphrase a little bit. So, to kick us off on this, I'm going to bring in something that Rose Ailing Ellis said. Now, you might know Rose from the soap on the BBC, EastEnders, or from, the, or from winning, being one of the winners of the TV series, Strictly, in 2021. Now, she said that there are many deaf people that have so many variants of hearing. So with this in mind, I want us to look at some definitions, sorry, some definitions that the British Deaf Association created some years ago. I use these definitions to inform my work with families around my hearing loss work. To be deaf with a capital D is to describe oneself as having a strong cultural affinity with other deaf people whose first or preferred language may be sign language. They may have little or no access to English and they will have a more severe to profound deafness. You may have actually heard of the deaf community those who consider themselves deaf with a capital D will have a very strong attachment to others in the deaf community. The 
word deaf without a capital D is often used to describe deaf people who do not use sign language. It's also used to describe those who do not consider themselves to be culturally deaf, as in deaf with a capital D. And it might also be used to describe those who have a, some degree of hearing loss in itself. According to the British Deaf Association, the deafened is a way to describe people who have experienced sudden hearing loss, often due to illness or injury. Now, people in this group often describe themselves as having a hearing loss or having a hearing problem and are likely to have learned to speak, to read and write before they went on to lose their hearing. And the British Deaf Association also um, considered the hard of hearing, who often have high levels of residual hearing, but may require additional volume or some kind of clarity or other adjustments. So, for example, hearing aids or cochlear implants. They may experience difficulty hearing speech and may no longer hear people whispering, for example. So from time to time, you may hear about deaf issues and quite often there is a conflict between these four groups. This is why it's so important to have an awareness of the differences so that we can understand the perspectives of each unique group. Now, in my book, which I wrote in 2013, I speak about being an in-betweener. Now, an in-betweener is someone who doesn't subscribe to the deaf community, nor is fully hearing. I actually found writing the book such a therapeutic experience that since then I've concluded that I'm never going to fit in. So I live life by standing out. And to be fair, we are all in-betweeners. So if you imagine yourself at a party, for example, we are always going to come into contact with somebody who is different. There are the more obvious differences, such as people of colour or people with physical disabilities. But then there are the less obvious differences, for example, people with a different sexual orientation or religious beliefs. The truth of the matter is we are surrounded by difference. So what happened here during the live session is I stopped for a bit. So I actually stopped sharing my screen and had a conversation with the 20 plus people that were on the session. And uh, we had some general comments, but what I really wanted to talk about was, given the four definitions of death with a capital D, death without a capital D, the deaf and the hard of hearing, is it possible to define a deaf identity? Okay. So at best, I think we can achieve a strong identity of which hearing loss is a very small part. Otherwise, there is a danger that our hearing loss defines us. So we had a discussion about this, but for the sake of confidentiality, I don't want to mention any names, but it was actually a very, very fruitful discussion. So as we continued with the presentation, um, I lent in again more on the Rose Ailing documentary, which you can actually watch in the UK on the BBC iPlayer. Now, I saw this segment and the accompanying audio from 1973 really reflected the attitudes at the time. So from 1973, it said that many deaf children are not diagnosed before the age of two. As a result, they may be retarded. And the longer the delay in binding them, the worse the handicap. This kind of language reminds me of when I went to my first cochlear implant conference in 2010. What happened was a very prominent professor took to the stage and said with confidence that a disabled child disables the whole family. I was actually quite shocked that such a blanket view from someone very educated, very well respected, was literally being projected onto the audience like this. 
Um, I, I, during the live session, I did ask, do you think your child has disabled you and your family? And the general response was a shaking of the head, so not affirmative. Um, I'm sure that you've had your own experiences with professionals who can sometimes come across a little bit insensitive. After many, many years, it's not uncommon to be desensitised to the needs of the work. Now, in my own family, my mum still recalls how an audiologist once said that I was either incredibly deaf or incredibly stupid. And this is why I created the Cochlear Implant Coach, because while I can really understand what families are going through, I can also see how much power a family can assert on getting their needs met. We're going to talk a bit more about needs getting met later. So just think how far we've come since 1973. There's been significant legal, social, economic and technological change. And I'm wondering how it would feel to trust in that generational progress. Now, the reason why I say this is because my parents worried enormously for my future. But look how well it's turned out. So I'm left wondering, do you? as a parent probably watching this, do you need to be worrying as much? Now I'm incredible, I'm incredibly grateful that I was born in the late 70s because it wasn't uncommon for deaf children to be put up for adoption in the 1960s and 70s. But just like lots of you out there, lots of amazing parents, you're persevering and doing your best. But I think it's also important that we acknowledge that society has progressed. And, and I'm wondering if we can trust in that and become less fearful, because by becoming less fearful, we minimise projections onto the child, which then leads to the child feeling less different and going on to feel more included, more inclusive even. And I can't help but wonder that if my parents had known that the internet was coming, for example, and all the communications possibilities that has brought, would they have worried so much? It's something worth thinking about. And it is true that how the family lives and copes with any sense of difference in a family is going to impact on how an individual grows up feeling about themselves. So what really is important? Is it that the family's handling in the early years goes well, or is the child's assimilation into a deaf culture more important? Ultimately, all children want to feel is accepted. And if they don't feel accepted by their own family, they will struggle to feel accepted by most people later in life. And I see this in my work every day. In the first session, we talked about where confidence comes from. So I want to do a poll. I wanted to do a poll with the live um, group. If you had a choice, like if you could choose one for your child, which would you choose? Would you choose a strong identity or would you choose confidence training? Now, the response to this was largely confidence is the most important thing. Okay, And that's absolutely right, because having a hearing loss is having a hearing loss and being able to connect with somebody with hearing loss can be very bonding, but it really is a very small part of your overall onion, your overall identity. It forms part of your identity, but if we make our hearing loss, our religions or our own opinions a huge part of our everyday presentation, 
we can be perceived as divisive. I like to think we are the sum of our parts. So the reason why I'm talking about this at such great length today is because many parents worry about their child's deaf identity. So I would actually go on to ask questions like this. What would having a deaf identity even affirm? So I'm going to add to this, do all diabetics have an identity? Do all people of colour share an identity? Are all gay people the same? No, they're not. And with so many different variants of hearing loss, can all deaf people be the same? Should they even aspire to be the same? The answer again is no. So I can't help but wonder if, if your child is that in-betweener and if you're really that concerned about whether your child might or might not fit in, given that there's more and more people having cochlear implants, should we be talking about a cochlear implant identity? These are just questions just to get us thinking about what the future might look like. And to also question, given that technological progress that I spoke about a few minutes ago, do we need to worry as much? So what is the answer? The answer is that developing confidence so that we can advocate to get our own needs met. This is, this is the absolute priority. Instilling a belief that we matter so that our children grow up believing that they matter too. But when I say this, I will emphasise equality, not priority. Now, my needs are not greater than anyone else's. They are just different. So when we go in wading in with poor communication, demanding X, Y and Z, um, this is how we run the risk of being perceived poorly. Now, in therapy sessions, we can explore ways in which we can get our needs met. We can explore ways to communicate those needs while also putting in place firm boundaries. Now, these are invaluable skills for anyone who is going through life feeling like a burden or feeling that they don't matter or feeling so disempowered that they don't advocate for themselves and end up not getting those needs met. These are all common experiences for people with hearing loss. And when we've managed to develop that confidence to get our needs met, we get the support that we need. We do unfortunately live in an ableist society um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term ableism or ableist, this means that the world is built for people who are able. It's not built for people who don't have any special needs. And therefore, deaf people are bound to face challenges rather than being considered when and as new products and services are being designed. Now, in this respect, we are slowly moving away from the medical model where people like myself need to be fixed to a social model where society considers how to include me as new products and services are being designed. But that change starts with us. If we get better at advocating for our own needs and we communicate those needs well, we will raise awareness among the hearing population of what needs they might need to consider going forward. If we get better at this, we will all feel more integrated. So that's the end of another session. Now, in case you're interested, here are some of the services that I can offer. Um, in the very least, please connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. 
but please take a moment to visit my website. So there's the cochleaimplantcoach.com and there's also stuartmcnorton.com. I am a qualified psychotherapist. I offer general counselling, but I created the cochleaimplantcoach.com specifically to communicate how I can help to anybody going through any hearing loss problems, any death related issues, but also the cochlear implant process itself. I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are and I hope to see you in a fourth session. So see you soon. Bye for now.